meditation, my heart, be ever mindful of thee, O Lord, by strength and by salvation. Amen. Amen. Would you please be seated? We're going to have fun this morning. Well, we have fun every Sunday. But I'm not going to do a doom and gloom sermon. Well, I always do a doom and gloom sermon. It's not going to be as doomy and gloomy. I want to talk to you about our reading from the book of Revelation. This is probably the only Episcopal church you will ever attend where we regularly preach about the book of Revelation. The Revelation to St. John. Happens. We're going to talk about this beautiful book. Now, for many people, Revelation, it's one of those things. If you went to Sunday school, you always started with Genesis, and you never quite got to Revelation, because it's always at the end. Or if you did, you opened it up, and it got a little kooky and hairy, and there are dragons and scrolls and all these things, and oh, well, let's turn back to some David Bathsheba. That's interesting. But the book of Revelation can seem a little strange enough. But you've got to, I, I urge you to someday to take it down and begin to look at it. And don't seem, don't try to just read it through in one whole sitting and say, well, that was fun, what did I get out of that? But take it in sections and in pieces and dwell upon it and listen to it and feel how it speaks to you. Because this is what I have discovered in my study of this book, that if I take passages that on the surface seem like, oh, well, that's nice, this is a little hairy, but if I go into it, God speaks to me in ways that just knock me out of my shoes. It is such a powerful revelation of how God is and works, what heaven is going to be like, how we should live in this world, what we should expect, how we should be. And if these aren't questions a Christian is asking himself, he's just not doing his job. So before we get there, <laughs> when I was a young man in college, I thought for a while of going into the business world. And I did work in business for a few years, and I even got an MBA. I was very happy because when I was 21, I went to the bishop in Philadelphia and said, okay, I give in, I'll be a priest. They said, fine, come back when you're 25. And I said, hallelujah, I don't have to be a priest. I can go out and get rich and go to Wall Street and make money and do all these fun things. And I went and I got an MBA and I studied marketing. And I learned how to sell things to people who don't have the money to buy things they don't need. And one of my favorite courses was looking at advertising in the past. Consumer advertising. Advertising to people rather than commercial advertising and commercial marketing. And we'd look at some of the great ad campaigns that we would have in the magazines of the 20s and 30s, early television jingles. But the most powerful, most long-lasting, most, at that time, life was going on, most powerful commercial that had been made up to the early 1980s was for a soft drink company, the Coca-Cola Corporation. Coca-Cola's advertising agencies and their internal marketing were always considered the best of the best. Now, it didn't necessarily translate into more Coca-Cola sales, but what Coca-Cola did was change the culture. You know, I've I, I preached this sermon. If you've been here one Christmas, you've heard me preach this. Where does Santa Claus's red and white outfit come from? It had been green and white in all the Courier and Ives prints up to the 1920s. Then Coca-Cola changed it to, what are Coca-Cola's colors? Red. Red, red and white. And, what, and now what do we have for Santa Claus? Red. He's red and white. That's the only reason why Santa Claus is dressed in red and white. It's because of the successful Coca-Cola marketing campaign in the 20s. But it, it's the summer of 1971. And if you turn on your TV, and in those days there were only three channels, remember? So you were going to see this one way or the other. The shot opens with a fresh-faced young woman looking up into the distance. Now, I always think of that, that scene from the movie Cabaret where they have the young Hitler youth, and you see them singing. They're so beautiful and lovely that they pan back, and you see the swastikas, and you think, oh my God, what I've been watching. 
Well, it starts just the same way, of freshness, of youth, of life. And this girl opens her eyes, and she says, I'd like to teach the world to sing. <laughs> In perfect harmony. <gasps> and the camera pans out, and there are all these children, young adults, men with terrible haircuts, <laughs> but girls and boys from all over the world, and it pans out, and it pans out, and it pans out, and it's a mountainside of young people all holding Coca-Cola bottles, white and yellow, red and black. I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. And then we have the Coca-Cola business and all that, but that ad, that, that ad was so powerful within the culture and the time of the day, it just knocked everybody's socks off. Now, and it was one of these ads that was so successful it didn't matter what it was selling. Because you really forgot, and see, that's, the pro that's, that's a sign of an ad that's too clever. When it's so good, you sort of forget what the product is, and you have to think about it. You want to think, you know, you want, when Dinah Short said, see the USA in a Chevrolet, you knew what she was talking about. But I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony, drowned everything out. And in fact, it became so powerful, it became a cultural motif, that for my generation of young people at that time, it's now almost regarded as sort of mawkish or a joke. It's just so all, it's so good, it's so bad. You see, understand what I'm saying? It's just so heavy-handed, peace and love and happiness and harmony. Who cares if Martin Luther King was just killed? Who cares if Bobby Kennedy was killed? Who cares if we're still in Vietnam? But by God, you can have a Coke. <laughs> this was a fantastic ad. And the problem was it was so good that it sort of spawned a reaction among people where it's like, that's so fake, it's so unreal. And it was fighting against a culture, my culture at the time, that was based upon tribe. I was a little boy. Imagine that. <laughs> my wife tells me I've never not been a little boy. And I went to a parochial school. And if you want to know about tribes, talk to little boys who go to parochial schools. I lived in the suburbs of Philadelphia and the Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. And the county would have busing. They had two busing systems, one for the public schools and one for the private schools. And the private schools were parochial schools. And they would go to, and the parochial schools were up, and, the, and the, on my bus route, students from three boys' schools got on that bus. Boys going down to Episcopal Academy. Guess what type of school that was? <laughs> Guess who went there? People like me. We all had our little blue blazers with a little shield. If we were under the age of 12, we had short pants. Oh, to be 12 and we could wear long pants, what a joy that was. <laughs> little blue and white tie. And then there'd be boys from the Catholic school. And the Catholic school boys had maroon blazers with little badges and maroon and gold ties. And then there were boys from Hebrew Academy. Guess what sort of school that was? <laughs> and they had their little, little outfits, plus something else. See, I'm not going to. These were all little boys living within blocks of each other who could be Zulus and Wachusis and Hutu. I mean, just completely different tribes. You didn't sit next to a Catholic boy if you're an Episcopalian. You didn't talk to a Jew. You were in your own tribe, in your own world. We played sports against each other. We had Protestant and Catholic and Jewish Boy Scout troops. I'm serious. That was normal, and it didn't seem to be a problem. You know, this was the world. You were in a world that you identified with other people just like you. And you wanted to be just like them. And hearing a Coca-Cola commercial ad, it was easier to feel kin and solidarity with some African in a TV commercial than a Catholic boy in the seat in front of you. Because our world was one of tribe, we knew we were going to heaven. We knew 
which way, you know, if Jesus were here right now, he'd be an Episcopalian wearing short pants and a blue blazer. <laughs> and he'd be speaking English. This is the world in which I grew up. Now, I'm not trying to be negative or critical. I had a great time. In fact, sometimes I wish I could go back to those days. Except the Philadelphia Phillies were dreadful then, and they're dreadful now, so very little changes. And let's not talk about the Eagles. So there is a great suffering of being from Philadelphia. You've never quite overcome your inferiority complex. So you've got a world in which you live as one of class, one of tribe. The joke, and this is an offensive joke if you think about it years later, we had more squash courts our school than African American students. It's a school of 800 boys, all boys, no girls. We had an integration meant, what did it mean? Kids from New Jersey, I guess, <laughs> who were Episcopalian and Protestant and just like us. That was the world in which I grew up. It wasn't an evil world, it wasn't a bad world, but it was a world where there were bare boundaries. You knew what the world was like. And I once made friends with a little a boy in my class, Artie Chu. He was Chinese. And I fell in love with his sister. And I remember my mother taking me to one side and said, Whatever you do, to your dying day, promise me you will never marry a Chinese girl. <laughs> I at eight, eight, eight years old. I didn't think this was going to be a pressing issue. But this was our world. And I'm sure Mrs. Chu sat down with her son and daughter and said, Whatever you do, this line. We, in the big picture, had this image of America that you would see in the old World War II movies of, of, the, of the airplane with an Italian guy from the Bronx and a farm boy and this and that and the other. But that was the idea. It wasn't the real. We had our TV telling us we should be loves and friends with everybody. But that wasn't real. And then we had our church that tells us in Christ there is the slave, the free, Greek, the Jew, male, nor female. There's only one in Christ. As a little choir boy, I would sing a song, In Christ there is no east or west, in him no south or north, but one great fellowship of man throughout the whole wide world. And we'd sing that, but did we live it? Did we believe it? Not particularly. Was it because we were evil? No, it's because we're fallen people who take the path of least resistance through life. My story could be recreated a thousand times over. You know, it's in almost a hackney, the Jets versus the Sharks in a Leonard Bernstein uh, West Side Story. Little boys, little girls who have almost everything in common, but they create barriers around them for whatever reason. Security, pride. <clears throat> but what does Jesus Christ tell us? Well, Christ was pretty clear. The Apostle Paul was pretty clear. And in the book of Revelation, it's pretty clear. Let me read you a passage that, that we had this morning. I looked. There's a great multitude that no one could count. There's a vision of heaven. This is heaven now. There's this multitude, this crowd, and they were from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. They crowd out in a loud voice, singing, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. What is this telling me? What is heaven now? <clears throat> is there an Episcopal heaven? And then in the next theater is a Baptist heaven. Is there a black heaven? Is there a white heaven? Is there a poor heaven? Is there a rich heaven? Is there a heaven for Episcopal school boys and Catholic school boys? No, there is. Because that crowd of white robe martyrs are of every race and every tongue and every tribe and every people singing glory and honor and praises to our God. Heaven has no walls between the walls between people are on this earth, and they're made by men. Mm -hmm. And our church is guilty of that, historically and traditionally. We have uh, cultural ways of doing things, and 
is that truly how God wants us to be? Close to the world around us? You know, I, I, I go to these uh, clergy, thing, uh, clergy, how do you build a bigger congregation? How do you? And, and I always sort of feel like, ha, 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 what can you people tell me? Uh, we don't even have enough parking in the season. Why should I want more people? But, you know, that's what priests love to do. Besides play golf and eat. Uh, is talk about attendance. And the little things that tell us is, you know, don't go after this demographic because they don't contribute the way other people do. You want to go first to the retirees who are not too old that they're incapacitated, but old enough that they're not, uh, that they still want to do something. In other words, we're given little slices. How do you effectively attract people that make a return on the investment of your time and energy in the parish? And this is all good and clever stuff, but it is, is this the image that God has of heaven for us? <clears throat> of people who can pay the freight? Of people who are like us? Or is heaven?
don't have to be perfect and have everything totally on the ball before you become a member of this church. You just have to be open to the love of Christ in your life and see where it takes you. That's frustrating. I have been the first to admit it. Uh, we have people say, George, what do I need to do to be a member? Because when I came from this other denomination, I had to be baptized, not having water sprinkled on me, but fully dunked in a tub, and I had to do this, and I had to do this, and I had to do this, and I had to do this. And I say, you have to show up, you have to believe, and help as you can. Is that all? I'd like to add more. You have to mow my lawn every three weeks. <laughs> But it's not about that. Being part of this church is being part of the fellowship of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. To be a member and officer, you need to be confirmed, not because you're holier, but then you take the classes so that you understand how we're supposed to do things. But will it save you to be confirmed? No, I don't think so, but I'm not going to tell the 12-year-olds that. give honor to him, to be among that white-robed army of martyrs who, and here's the other thing, and I can have a whole second and third and fourth of this sermon. These are people who have suffered in this life. It doesn't say they suffered because of the faith, but they have gone through trials and sufferings in their lives. And their response to pain and their response to death and their response to heartache is to worship God. Not to moan and and that's a whole other sore store, sir. But this is just one little slice of a fantastic book that I urge you to read. How do you treat fellow Christians? How do you handle suffering? How do you live as a Christian in a fallen, broken world where sin is all around us? It's not positive thinking. It's the example. We're given in the words of the Bible. This is the source. This is from where we were. Everything else follows a path. My job as a priest is not to tell you what to think. You would do it anyway. Or to boss you, or to say, these are the, these are, you know, I'm the gatekeeper. No, my job is to teach. It's to preach, is to celebrate the sacraments, it's to walk with you, alongside you, as you walk towards the goal of Jesus Christ. I can't carry it. I shouldn't carry it. No one can. There's only one advocator, there's only one advocate, there's only one mediator, and that's Jesus Christ. And he is who is leading you to the Father. The church is that vehicle by which you make that connection. But don't close the door on people who look or sound or smell differently than you. God works in such mysterious ways that for us to say this is the right way or this is the wrong way is really just plain foolish. Love the Lord your God. Worship. Thank you.